open up to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. We're going to finish up Matthew 5 here this evening with the last verse. We've gone through uh, Matthew 5. I hope you maybe you've got... Uh, we've got the handouts for it. If you have something that you've missed, all of the messages are available online, and then we also have the handouts. If you're missing one of those, I can get one for you if it would help you. Remember, when Jesus spoke these words, Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus spoke these words, they were delivered as a spoken sermon. They weren't delivered as chapters and verses. Jesus didn't, didn't pause and say, Verse 13, and then, and then say a portion. He, he, just, he just spoke. Uh, and so in, in the case as we're reading this, the end of chapter 5 does bring a close to the subject and style in which Jesus has taught so far. So uh, sometimes uh, I would uh, disagree with where the translators put a, a chapter division or a verse division. Sometimes they cut it right in the middle of a sentence or even in the middle of a thought. Uh, but in this case, it does work very, very well because chapter 5, uh, Jesus has been preaching. He begins with the Beatitudes in verses 13 or verses 3 through 12. Then he goes into the explanation of the disciples' duty to behave like the salt and light that they are. Uh, remember, he doesn't say you need to be. He says you are, and so this is how you need to act. And then we come to the section that we've been in for the last few weeks, beginning in verse 17, in which Jesus compares the teachings and traditions of the Jewish elders concerning the law with the true meaning of the law. And he kind of lays this out repeatedly as he goes. Remember, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they considered themselves, we could say, good enough. Well, I'm good enough uh, to be accepted because they had avoided in most of these cases, remember, they had taken what God said in the law of Moses, and they had boiled down what God had said, and they reduced it to a physical act. I have never murdered anybody because I've never actually taken the knife and ended someone's life. But Jesus expounds on that. But it's interesting that while they had taken the law of God, given in, in, the, in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, they had reduced that to some physical acts, but then at the same time, they had multiplied and they had expanded all of their traditions. So they had taken the, essentially, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, the books where we find most of the law, and they had expanded that to 12 books of what we would call the Mishnah, or the, the traditions that they were to keep, some of them quite ridiculous. Jesus reveals through a series of comparisons that they were actually guilty before God because they had broken the spirit of the law. You don't have to take a knife and murder someone. He who hates his brother without cause has committed, a, has, has committed murder. He that looks on a woman to lust has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so from verse four, 17 to verse 47, Jesus explains God's righteous standard regarding murder Offense, adultery, purity, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and loving your enemies. And he lays all of this out. And this evening, Jesus is going to kind of put a capstone on this portion of teaching. He's going to, to kind of uh, put the cherry on top of this portion. He's not done with his sermon. Again, there's chapter 6 and chapter 7 yet to come. But this kind of is the end of part 1 is how we could look at it. So it does coincide with the end of the chapter. And he caps this off with an unreachable standard that you see there on your handout. Verse 48, he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. When Jesus says ye, remember, Jesus is speaking to those who would be his genuine disciples. He's speaking to people who, who have a desire to walk with God. People who have it, they, they understand who he is. Jesus is not telling the lost people that this is how they should reform themselves. Jesus is telling believers, this is how a believer should act. He says, therefore. Therefore is a connecting word. When you read therefore in verse 48, 
it harkens back to everything that has been said. The sermon starts in verse 3 of this chapter, and it carries on. So Jesus says, be ye therefore, in light of everything that I've just said, and we're going to look at it in light of its big context and in light of its little context here this evening. But the word that brings the most attention to us is the word perfect. Be ye therefore perfect. Perfect. You immediately see the problem. Uh, we're not. But let's take a look at what perfect means. It's the Greek word teleos. It means, it has several different definitions. It means free from any deficient, deficiency, omission, or corruption. That's one. This is, this is perfect, meaning it's made exactly to specs. This is mature. This is wanting nothing necessary to completeness. It's fulfilling a purpose. Within the broader context of the passage, needing to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees, this perfection is impossible. Do you remember in verse 44, Jesus says, uh, not, not in verse 44, uh, but Jesus says that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus lays this out. There's the, there's the standard. The, remember, the religious leaders say, well, I'm pretty good. I'm good enough even. But Jesus says, the, the best people you know, the people who you think of, if anybody's going to make it, it's that person. Jesus says, you have to be better than that person. Even the Pharisees would say, that's impossible. We're as good as it gets. <laughs> Obviously, Jesus is going to point that out. It's impossible. For us to reach perfection, to reach God's standard. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The, the, the message that we've gone over and over and over in Galatians on Sunday evening is right here. Where he says, look, you can't earn favor with God by keeping the law because you can't keep the law well enough. You, you're not, no one is good enough. No one's going to reach God's standard. By the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. And the reason for that is in James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. And you've got 613 commandments. Okay. Imagine, if, if you will, you go out and we have the the Iowa Penal Code. But let's narrow it down even more. You have the Iowa Driver's Code. And you go out and you're driving. If you go on a long trip, let's say that you're going to drive 12 hours. In the course of your driving 12 hours, if you drive through town, what is the likelihood that you will in some way shave just a little bit too close and you'll break what we would consider maybe a mediocre law or a minor law, but what's the chances of you breaking some part of the driving code? Pretty high, because there's an awful lot of them. You, you fail to signal this way, or you don't do something that you're supposed to do. Whatever the case is, with God's law, we've all broken God's law. 1 Peter 1 verse 15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, no, another good uh, kind of a synonym here. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Well, perfect and holy, neither one of those in any way describes me <laughs> at all. No, in and of myself, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm not holy. I miss God's standard. Again, the verses that we just read. True moral perfection is impossible for man. But, Matthew 9, 26, 9, 26, Jesus says, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You can't keep the law enough to be perfect. It, again, if from this point on you were able to maintain the law, would you be perfect? No, because you've got your past to deal with. All of us have broken God's law. Uh, if I were to start being perfect, I wouldn't be perfect because of my past. And, and God points that out all throughout his word. 
The only hope that man has of attaining God's unreachable standard when he says, be ye therefore perfect. Oh, goodness, I can't be perfect. Be ye therefore holy. I can't do that. The only hope that we have of reaching that standard is through Christ. Romans 10 verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You can't keep the law. But Christ did, and he offers you his perfection. Philippians 3, 9, Paul says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Remember, the apostle Paul had been a Pharisee. He had lived this life. And he says, Being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So, in and of yourself, the, the message here of, of this portion of what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, be ye therefore perfect, you can't. But God can, and he offers you the perfection of Christ. So, that's one of the legitimate explanations of this passage. But there's another application for this word. This word, when we say perfect... There's another application found within the more immediate context. So in light of all of chapter 5, be ye therefore perfect, you can't be. Okay? And so you need Christ. You need a Savior who is perfect. But let's, let's narrow our focus a little bit. Let's zoom in to the, to the last portion of chapter 5, starting in verse 43, where he's speaking about love. <coughs> Where, where Jesus says, you've heard it hath been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Skip ahead to verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? So he's talking about love. So in the context of love, the immediate context, there's some application here. Do you know what a number four Phillips screwdriver is? Number four is the biggest, one of the bigger ones. That's what you take out industrial screws with. Great big, it's, it doesn't have a point on it. It's flat, okay? That's a big screwdriver. What happens if I take out a number four screwdriver to work on my watch? How's it going to work? It's not going to work, is it? Why? Because how about if I take the screwdriver that I would use to work on my watch and I take it and try to take out a number four Phillips? Well, that wouldn't work either. Neither one will work. I'm using something that's very tiny to take out something that's very big or I'm trying to use something that's very big to take out something very <coughs> tiny. But when you get the proper tool to the job, when you take, if you've ever done this, if you've ever been trying to take out a screw, and you've got, you don't have the right screwdriver and you end up and you ruin the screw. You, you ever done that? I, I know I'm not the only one. But you know how it feels when you, you realize what you've done and so you say, that's it. I'm going to go for me, banners close. So I go down I say, I'm going to run down to the hardware store and I'm going to buy the right tool. And I get it and I put the, the right size screwdriver into the screw and it fits, we could say, perfectly. Okay. The context here, it's a perfect fit, so now I can bear down on it, and I'm not going to ruin the screwdriver. I'm not going to ruin the screw. It just works. It works perfectly. In light of that, in light of the, the context of love, how can a Christian, how can a disciple, a genuine disciple, that's who Jesus is talking about here in verse 48, be ye, he's talking about those who, who are genuine disciples. How can a Christian most perfectly demonstrate our rebirth? What does maturity look like in the life of a Christian? Maturity is one of the definitions of perfect, okay? To be mature. How can a Christian best do that? 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that if any man is in Christ... That old things are passed away, all things are become new. That man is a new creature. How can I best and most, most uh, 
most broadly expose myself as a Christian? What's, what's going to show up the best? Well, Matthew twenty two thirty six, 36, Jesus was answering a question. It's, uh, someone asked, Master, which is the greatest command in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, we looked at this passage last week in the context of loving your neighbor and hating your enemy. The best way that I can show that I'm a Christian, the best way that I can show the perfection of Christ is through love. Love for God and love for our neighbors is the foundation of obedience to all of God's commandments. We've explained this many times. If you love God, you've got the first four commandments of the ten down pat. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you've got the last six all down. It just works that way. But it's not merely love for God and love for our neighbors. Look at verse 44. The, the greater context but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So what we're doing is we're looking for the right tool to best showcase that we are believers. The best way to show a lost world that I'm a believer, that I'm a changed person, that I'm a new creature is going to be by love. Not just love for my friends, not just love for my neighbors, but also love for my enemies. We looked at verse 44 in depth last week. That's not a natural kind of love, is it? To love your enemies. We could say that is a supernatural kind of love. This is the love that was modeled for us by God. Romans 5, 6, For when ye were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Aren't you glad that, that God didn't just look down from heaven and die for the good ones? You know, you know what? If he would have only died for the good ones, he wouldn't have died. Because there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Back to the question we asked that we've already answered. How can a Christian most perfectly demonstrate our rebirth? What does maturity look like in, the, in a child of God? It looks like love. When I demonstrate the love of God, 1 John 4, 8, God even says this. He says, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. <laughs> if, if I say, I just hate everybody, and I'm not, just, I'm not just goofing around, I'm serious, I just hate everybody. That's not a good sign of, of my salvation. Is it? <laughs> love for my brethren, love for my neighbors. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I, I, I should love you. You should love me. And, and we all know that we're not perfect, but we love one another. And by our love, people know us to be believers. They see that, that there's something. That's, that's they, they wouldn't say the word perfect because we don't use it that way anymore. But they'd say, there goes a Christian they're weird, might be how they would say it. They're weird. Why are they weird? Well, because they love people. Well, you mean they love people who love them back. Well, yeah, but they also love their enemies, as we've already seen in verses 44 through verse 47. That's a sign of maturity. That's a sign of being a genuine disciple of Christ. You want to show people that you are a believer? Without ever having to say anything, love people. Love your friends. Love your neighbors. Love your enemies. 
That's the real one. That's, that's the one that people say, well, I can understand why they love their family and their friends and their neighbor, but they, they love people who don't love them back. To get real practical, what does God's love look like? Well, probably no better place to turn for a description of Christ-like love than 1 Corinthians 13. If you've ever been to a wedding, most of the time, wedding brochures and stuff have this printed somewhere on them. Part of 1 Corinthians 13, we call it the love chapter. Let me give you just a little bit. We're not going to look at the whole thing, but here's what you, you want to be perfect. You want to, to be a mature believer. Here's what your love should look like, okay? Here it is, verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13. Charity, or love, suffereth long, meaning it's patient. Charity, love, has a long fuse. Love is kind. The word actually means benevolent. It's, it's, it's kind even to those who can't repay. Charity, or love, envieth not, meaning that there's loyalty there. It's not a, it's not a jealousy. It's, it's a, loyal, uh, a loyal characteristic. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, meaning it's, it's humble. There's humility in true love, Christ's love. It doth not behave itself unseemly, meaning it's always appropriate. It seeketh not her own, meaning it's not selfish. Christ-like love doesn't have an agenda. Christ-like love gives and gives and gives and gives. Seeketh not her own is not easily provoked, meaning, it, again, a long fuse. It, it's interesting that, that Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would repeat that same characteristic several times in different ways so that we would get it. Love, Christ's love, has a long fuse. It takes a lot to, to, to set love off. <laughs> Matter of fact, you can't set true love <clears throat> off. <clears throat> it thinketh no evil, meaning it believes the best. Verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 13, it rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. It's passionate about righteousness. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Meaning it's unending. It just keeps going. Charity never faileth. It's consistent. A believer which is what we want to be. We want to be believers who have our, our sight set on Christ. We want to be believers who are living for eternity. We want to be believers who have a testimony to the lost world around us. And the way that it looks is loving. It looks perfect in love. It looks mature. A believer best shows forth the evidence of his rebirth. When he manifests this kind of Christ-like love that we see in 1 Corinthians 13. You could go, there's a lot more in 1 Corinthians 13. And again, we're, we're showing all of the love of 1 Corinthians 13, not just for our friends, not just for our neighbors, not just for those who are easy to love, but also for our enemies. That's supernatural. That's not going to happen by, by itself. That's only going to happen... <coughs> With the help of God. Mankind's only hope for perfection. Moral perfection. Our only hope. Is having the righteousness of Christ. Credited to their account. By grace through faith. You can't be whole. <laughs> Would you agree with that? You can't be whole. I can't be whole. Christ can. And he offers me his holiness. In exchange for my sin. A believer's only hope for leading a life. Of Christ-like holiness is by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit, you'll manifest the fruit of the Spirit. If you walk in the flesh, you'll manifest the works of the flesh. That's just the way it works. But when it comes to maturity, in the context of verse 40, 43 down to verse 48, if we look at it in light of the context of loving our neighbors and loving our enemies... When it comes to maturity, the believer best shows the redeeming work that Christ has done in them when they show love, his love, for all, even the unlovely. And all of us have opportunities to do this from time to time. 
you come across unlovely people sometimes. Truth be told, all of us are unlovely sometimes. And we sure appreciate when this love is shown to us. It's a sign of maturity when we show it to others. 